All right, I have a few questions to get us started with this evening. Please raise your hand if you love the arts. All right, good. You're in the right lecture. So please raise your hand if you were once a child. You got it all right? If you're still a child. Please raise your hand if you consider yourself an artist. Pablo Picasso said every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain one once we grow up. Tonight's discussion is about how participating and creating in the arts creates mm -hmm. community. I'm Sarah Roy, Executive Director of the Red Brick Center for the Arts here in Aspen, and I was so pleased to be asked by Kitty Boone and the Ideas Festival to kick off tonight's discussion uh, by sharing with you about the new street mural we have outside of this Wheeler Opera House. So Kitty Boone um, approached the city earlier this spring with this idea. She had learned about street murals through Bloomberg Philanthropies and their Asphalt Art Initiative program. Kitty's timing was pretty serendipitous because the city of Aspen, uh, led by the Red Brick Center for the Arts, was just launching a community conversation to create Aspen's first ever public art plan. And this presented itself as the perfect pilot project for our effort. What was really appealing about street murals is not only does it work to enhance and beautify an area, but it's been proven to actually increase pedestrian safety. But what was most appealing is the fact that street murals are often painted by the community. And that level of kind of participation and activation can really instill a sense of ownership and pride and a deeper connection to place. So fast forward five months, here we are. We have an amazing new street mural out front uh, designed by Chris Erickson, our local artist, um, and, <laughs> and painted by our community this past Sunday. So we had about over 100 volunteers that day come out. Um, all ages, all artistic abilities. We had folks just walking by that joined in with us. So it really was a magical day. And a big thanks to Chris and his team for sure. So I um, also want to thank Kitty Boone, the Ideas Festival, especially Ava Hartman, um, our mayor, our council members, our city manager's office for their support, the many city staff, especially PJ Murray, that worked on this effort to get it done. Um, and again, Chris. So if you want to learn more about our work to create Aspen's first ever public art plan and join in the conversation, we are looking for ideas, suggestions. We want everyone's voice to be this. Please visit aspencommunityvoice.com or come find me at the Red Brick Center for the Arts. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Damian Watzel. He is the president of the Juilliard School, and he will be moderating tonight's session. So Thank thanks you so, so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. So now that we all have our common ground, uh, we love arts. We were once children. We're going to address in this a little bit that slight discrepancy in those who think they're artists and who aren't, and we'll get to that. Uh, I'm joined today by an incredibly uh, accomplished panel in this intersection of arts and uh, civic glue is the title of this. Uh, I think of it as a, a through line of society. Uh, and I'll start by introducing uh, my colleagues. To my left is Kate Levin. Uh, Kate was the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs for New York City for about 12 years under Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, and those of you who visited the city during those years have felt the power of Kate Levin. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you walked by the gates or experienced the revival of the city uh, post 9-11, uh, right up to the final days, right up to the moment today in her role as the lead of Bloomberg Philanthropies for the Arts, uh, when you watch uh, little Amal walk through streets, whether in New York or elsewhere, uh, Kate is a hero in making sure that art is civic glue giving it the opportunity to be. So I'm privileged to be with you, Kate. Uh, Kate's left uh, is Mayor Melvin Carter of St. Paul, uh, first elected 2017, re-elected in 2021, uh, city council before that. And as I learned today, he's going to be pivotal in this discussion about whether we're an artist or not, because he is a musician, whether he wants to label himself or not. Uh, but the truth is, as a, as a leader, uh, of a city in America that is, uh, has unique characteristics. It's gonna be a fascinating opportunity to hear about a specific place because just like all politics are local, all art is local. And may I call out where we are today in a Wheeler Opera House in the center of town, a nexus, now enlivened by this incredible street mural. And this is, this is a, a metaphor for everything that the arts can accomplish. So we're looking forward to talking with you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And on the far left, Karen Brunwasser, uh, who is a co-founder and chief strategy officer of an organization with three names in Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, among them is Fieldbite, 
Uh, and among the initiatives that they have is a new center straddling the seam between East and West Jerusalem, making art, bringing art together, bringing people together through art, through music, through dance. Uh, and we're going to get to hear all about that initiative uh, and give it a global context, uh, and yet still intensely local. Uh, I myself was a dancer for many years in New York City Ballet. Uh, I'm currently the, thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Mayor called me out earlier because uh, I said something, I think I said former, and he said, why did you say former? And I said, got me, okay, it's true. Uh, because there is an identity issue in this that's at play. Uh, and if we really want to take advantage of what the artistic and creative impulses are in society, I think we should reckon with that a little bit. Uh, my current role is as leading the Juilliard School with uh, 850 of the most extraordinary young musicians, actors, and dancers, choreographers, composers, playwrights, the people who make the art, the people who do the art. And chief among the mission of this is to turn them all into citizen artists, how they go forward into the world and not only uh, play, dance, act at the highest level, but what does it do, who is it for, where does it happen, in what circumstances does it happen. I also direct a, a dance festival on a mountain not too far from here, uh, Vail, uh, every summer. And it's an analogy for me there as well, because it was a series of performances until those performers took to the streets to dance with the people, until those artists became part of the free education program for kids in the area until certain performances were designated community performances that brought in audiences that had never been to a performance in the Gerald R. Ford Amphitheater. Uh, with my wife, Heather Watts, also a dancer, uh, we, we fashioned this, this festival to be part of civic engagement as a whole, not simply to exercise great art. So I want to start with Kate, uh, and I want to start where Sarah left off, which is just outside. Uh, she mentioned that this was inspired by Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, that must feel good. Uh, you were tremendously excited this weekend, uh, saying, it's happening. They're out there. They're doing it. Uh, tell us a little bit about that sure. in, in, as, as, a, as a, a model uh, for you. Well, I, just, I first want to recognize Chris again. Uh, amazing work. I got to go by a couple of times while everyone was painting, and it was great to see not only his creative vision, but his great leadership in letting people actually help him make it work, which not all artists are necessarily all that comfortable with. So thank you and congratulations. Bravo. So just a little bit about having, um, as Damien said, I uh, worked in government in the arts, and that's not always the most comfortable relationship, although if there are an amazing mayors, and I worked for one, uh, you can try a lot of things. And one of the things we did around this issue of Civic Glue is to really experiment and push out on public art, both permanent and temporary. And the day that Mike Bloomberg took office, he said, one of the things I want to do is that Christo and Jean-Claude project called The Gates that had been sitting in a drawer for 26 years. Mm -hmm. They'd proposed a massive public art project in Central Park and had been told no for 26 years. Um, and so in 2005, it opened for 16 days. I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with the work of Christo and Jean-Claude, but very temporary, very immersive. Um, and uh, it was the first time after 9-11 that the city of New York was in every form of public media for something that wasn't about death, wasn't about money, wasn't about politics, but was something about something sort of whimsical and wonderful and creative and that everybody could have an opinion about and everybody was right. And it just sort of reset New York. Um, and you know, fortunately, it's hard to go back and recapture how fragile the city was after 9-11. Um, but it was, you know, that, that was sort of a, a, a watershed moment for lots of reasons. Fast forward, we started uh, working, and I had a terrific, I have a terrific uh, still colleague, because we still work together, Jeanette Sadek Khan, who is very interested from the point of view of transportation in public art as well. So starting to pedestrianize parts of the city and starting to use temporary murals on the roads and figure out what paint services that means, and if it's temporary, it's okay if it wears off, et cetera. So one of the things that we decided to do at the foundation was try and codify that a little bit. We came up with the name Asphalt Art as a way of making clear this wasn't a big, fancy taste kind of issue. 
Uh, every city has remarkable artists. This shouldn't be about getting all stuck on a jury necessarily. Um, and you know, there are a lot of regulations when you try and make something permanent. So we've called it Asphalt Art. So far, we have funded uh, 64 projects. Um, about two thirds of them are in the United States. One third of them are in Europe. Um, we're in the middle of a funding round to hopefully do more projects, is spreading it to Canada and to Mexico. And just, um, Paul, if you could go to the next slide, just a, just a couple of before and after examples, because I think part of what we have found is so strong about this is that it's one of the opportunities where you can actually quantify uh, the results of an art project in a way that means a lot to people. Safety is an extraordinary concern. Um, so uh, if you could go to the next slide, Paul. This, this is a particularly interesting one in a way because this wasn't an intersection. This was a capped off train trench in Reno, Nevada that was a very large, uh, it's, it's hard to get the scale of how big this is, but it was just sort of a complete dead spot in the middle of the city. Um, and it now has become the go-to place for public festivals, for yoga classes, um, et cetera. Um, and one more. Uh, this is Saginaw, Michigan. Um, this was actually sewing together two parts of a city that were both economically and racially very divided. And so one of the things we're happiest about is the stat about uh, business owners um, finding that uh, this had increased pedestrian traffic and uh, helped their uh, businesses. So one of the, the final things I'll say is that a key to doing this was actually doing a traffic safety study. Because in the United States, there are a lot of politics about what color paint you can put on a roadway, given that a lot of traffic engineering is about making cars go faster and not necessarily looking out for pedestrian safety, um, which is why one of the things we're seeing in uh, US cities is a real uptick in uh, car accidents. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so being able to prove uh, that in fact these kinds of treatments uh, reduce crashes by 50%, reduce uh, crashes with injuries uh, by 37%. You know, there, there are a bunch of other statistics relating to this, but what's great is that that has inspired a number of municipalities that we haven't yet had the privilege of giving financial support to to do these kind of projects. So you know, it was an incredible honor uh, when Kitty and the city of Aspen decided to take this on and um, look forward to seeing uh, how this works out for y'all. Wonderful. You know, it makes me think a little bit about the, the covert quality of that. You know, do people, did you experience that when you walked in and you saw that? Did you think, oh, this is gonna make it safer? Perhaps not, probably not, you'll know that now. But actually, it's, it's intrinsic to the, the enterprise that it has other qualities beyond simply what it appears to be. And I think that's overall in the arts. I think that's what we hope for. One of the panels yesterday we were talking about uh, uh, with Oscar Eustace and James Imes and Ayanna Thompson talked about the purpose of a play is to build an audience. And they didn't mean ticket sales. They meant actually to build an audience, people to experience something together. That itself is a covert thing. You think you're going to a play, you're actually going to be a part of a community, to be a part of something. And that is glue. That is something else. Uh, Mayor, turning to you, how does, how does this intersect with you? And I know we talked a little bit about some past experiences that inspired yeah. you. Uh, and I know there's some, some, some tactical maneuvers as well that you take uh, where the arts are extremely important. Yes, yeah, certainly. It, it, it impacts us incredibly. I was sort of raised in the arts. I was uh, joking while well, sharing earlier. I you know, came and grew up into like a very musical family. Music is how our family sort of uh, combines and does holidays and things like that. Uh, I've, my parents met in a band together and, you know, we got lots of, uh, my grandfather was a pretty prolific jazz trumpet player who played with, you know, you, you name a jazz trumpet player of that era and he played with them. Um, and so like none of me or my cousins, like we all play at instruments and uh -huh. at music, but none of us like really consider ourselves musicians because we're on the bench in the family band. Um, and, and it's hard to build, <laughs> you know, it's hard to build a little bit of confidence when uh, you can't get off the bench in the family band. Um, but that is to say, I grew up in arts traditions. Uh, I grew up in a city that's uh, home to Penumbra Theater. 
uh, which is one of the oldest, historic, oldest black theater companies, home of uh, August, Will, home theater company of August Wilson, if you know the playwright August Wilson, uh, and many, many other incredible talents. Uh, I grew up in a city that, you know, I'd go to church on Sunday and, you know, hear the sound, like members of the Sounds of Blackness singing in the church choir on Sunday. Messed me up. I went to Florida for college and I'm sitting in the, you know, church trying to listen. And I'm like, there's nobody Grammy nominated in here at all. <laughs> um, but I just grew up in this space that really, really valued the arts. And so my okay. favorite piece of art in the city uh, actually sits on my wall uh, <laughs> as you walk into the mayor's office. And it's a piece, of, it's a mosaic art uh, that says a city uh, that works for all. Um, and it's a piece that during my first campaign, one of our local mosaic artists designed. Uh, and for a year, as people came to pick up phone call lists and door knock lists and things like that, uh, they also just went and picked up a broken piece of glass and some glue and glued it on this thing. Uh, and we made this thing together uh, as a community over the course of, uh, over the course of a year. Um, and I always tell folks, it is a visual representation of our vision for the city. Because people from different neighborhoods who, you know, different income levels, different races, different, you know, cultures, different walks of life, who might never actually meet and never engage each other uh, in any other fashion, uh, work together to take pieces of trash and make something incredibly beautiful. Uh, and that's why it's my favorite piece of art in the city. I shared with you earlier, um, I was in Cuba about, I guess, eight years ago. Uh, and I was in Havana, touring Havana, and there's a neighborhood just outside of Havana called Fusterlandia. Uh, and it's named after this artist named Jose Fuster, uh, who, and I'm probably pronouncing everything oh, wrong. I, I jumped your slide, sorry. That's okay, I think we skipped it. Um, but there's a, uh, there, there's a neighborhood where this guy lives in this neighborhood and he starts just mosaic tiling his house. And he mo kind of finishes tiling his house and starts tiling his uh, picnic table and starts tiling the tree. And uh, here we are uh, years later. It's the number four thing on trip, thing to see on TripAdvisor for Havana. Um, I was in this area and it was just so fantastic. It was so phenomenal. It's not that this neighborhood has art. It's the neighborhood is art. Um, from the bus benches to the curbs to everything else. Um, and uh, I had taken my little allowance for the day and left the rest in the hotel. Uh, and I was down to my last kind of couple of dollars for the day. Um, and I wanted the book, but I also needed to catch a cab back to Havana. And long story short, I don't know if this makes you think highly, more highly or less highly of me, um, I bought the book and hitchhiked back to Havana. <laughs> more, more. And more? <laughs> I'm in the right room then. And it occurred to me on my way back that I just spent more money in this neighborhood, in this mm. community than I planned to because of art. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes miss, I think we see art, and my, some of our local folks have uh, 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 oriented me to the phrase plop art, uh, when you sort of do what you were gonna do and then plop some art there, right? And mm. we, we sort of see art oftentimes as an extracurricular thing, mm -hmm. as opposed to a part of the thing. Right? And that's what I meant when I said this is not a community that has art, it's a community that is art. Um, and it's really remarkable. So, so we kind of have taken on the challenge of trying to figure out how, you know, we're a city that students in our public schools speak over 120 different languages at home. People come to St. Paul from all over the country and all over the globe. Uh, you know, we're, we're a community that if you tell me that someone's an African immigrant, you got to tell me a lot more information for me to know anything about the person that you're talking about. Um, but you can drive around our city all day long and not know that. Mm -hmm. And so we've kind of, we're taking the challenge now from a public art perspective, from a public realm perspective to say, how do we create a public realm that just screams place, that just screams culture, that just screams, not that when you're on your streets, our streets, you're on your way somewhere, mm -hmm. but when you're on our streets, you are somewhere. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm a big fan of uh, Jeanette's uh, work and your work as well. So that's some of the work that we, uh, on the screen there was a, a, a tile, one of, our, one of our fun projects that we do, uh, that we do, uh, we call Sidewalk Poetry. And we invite community members to write poems and submit uh, submissions uh, to be stamped into, uh, stamped into Sidewalk. And so if you walk through St. Paul, uh, every 15, you know, sidewalk tiles or whatever it is, uh, you might just stumble upon a poem. This one says, a dog on a walk is like a person in love. You can't tell them it's the same old world. Beautiful. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> so, Karen, we're, we're gonna shift now across the world, and yeah. yet it's local. Because if there is a, a more <laughs> unique city, I don't know it, than Jerusalem. For we're uniquely unique, yes. Uniquely unique. That's true. Um, 
I can say that from my experience, I danced in a lot of places, but I did dance in Jerusalem and I came home wow. just saying it was just not like no place I'd ever been in so many different ways. So an art is intrinsic to that. The ritual is intrinsic to that, uh, whether in East Jerusalem or, or West Jerusalem. And you have decided uh, to dedicate your work to straddling that divide and to, to erasing it actually through art. You want to talk a little bit about that? I know you have a film, but uh, sure, sure, you take? Um, with pleasure. And I have to say, uh, what a crazy honor it is to come from Jerusalem and sit on a panel with with the three of you. I, I'm, I'm I'm kind of blown away by by this opportunity. I was nervous, and then I realized we're in a bar, and I felt much much better um, <laughs> because, <laughs> you know. It's funny, because when I was single, I went to a lot of bars, and people would say to me, you know, you're never going to meet a guy in a bar. And I would say to them, you know, my grandparents met in a bar. My parents met in a bar. And I have my 10th anniversary with my husband this year, and we met in a bar. So anyway, I feel very comfortable in this bar. Um, but yes, I, I, you might be able to tell that from my accent, I wasn't born in Jerusalem. I'm from Philly, very proud Philadelphian. Um, and my parents made a very big mistake when I was 16 years old. In their opinion, they took our family to Jerusalem, to Israel, and I fell madly in love with it and was tried very hard for about 10 years to get over it. I was unsuccessful, and I eventually wound up moving to Jerusalem, this incredible city that I um, feel very passionate about to this day. But uh, it's a very complicated city. It's a city that you can love with tremendous depth, and it will routinely break your heart. Um, and um, we are... I'm very privileged to be part of this incredible effort of Palestinians and Israelis of all religions, uh, those who are not religious, different ideologies, um, different approaches. We're trying to create a, a home together through the arts, um, through community, and through sort of a shared commitment to hold each other tight when our city goes through the convulsions that it goes through all the time, including what it's going through right now. But maybe since it's far away, just to give you a little, a little taste of what I'm talking about. Um, we, can, we, can shoot the, we can play the video. I'll just apologize to the folks on this side. There are uh, subtitles. Um, we operate primarily in Arabic and Hebrew, but there are English subtitles. Um, and I apologize for those who might have a hard time seeing them, but I will say that in Jerusalem, it's a city where 40% um, of the, the residents are Palestinian, 60% are more or less are Israeli. Um, and we don't actually speak a common language oftentimes. We, there is not, in, many, in, in my work, there is not one language that we all speak at once. So we're constantly switching, which means that everybody feels uncomfortable some of the time. There's always something that you can't completely understand. So in a certain way, you're going to get a little bit of that experience if you can't see the subtitles. OK. This was this was a crowdfunding video, <laughs> so forget that part. But um, or support them. Or actually, yeah, you know what? That's not bad too. That wasn't meant for this one. Um, so so that that's feel bit, and it's this crazy dream that we're trying to realize day by day. Um, we started 12 years ago as an arts organization, a professional arts organization that brought on board some of the, the really leading people in the country in arts, multidisciplinary arts, and what we started doing um, was creating. Uh, wild productions all over the city of Jerusalem uh, that were meant to sort of 
start healing a city that was coming out of a very rough period of violence called the Second Intifada, um, uh, humanizing across divides and that sort of a thing. Um, and we, over time, really understood just how powerful these arts, arts were as, as a way of allowing people who really live completely parallel lives in the same city to, to, and, 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 conf and lives in conflict to see um, the person on the other side of the threat. Um, and um, we successfully, over time, after so many mistakes and screwing up for over and over and over with how you bring people together in the city, we slowly, over time, started making some progress. It had a lot to do with the people that we brought on board. My extraordinary colleague, Riman Barakat, is here and will be presenting on Friday um, on, also about some of the work we do. Um, she's Palestinian from East Jerusalem. And we figured, and um, we started building this shared community. Here she is, on cue, amazing. I, she didn't realize Wheeler was in town. It's my fault, I didn't tell her. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then we started creating arts events where people started interacting and engaging, uh, Israelis, Palestinians, and all different kinds of other folks. And Riman said, um, we can't just do this in a festival format. We can't just have events. We have to do this every day. And that's when the idea for this, this culture house that's exactly on the seam line between East and West Jerusalem came from. Um, I'll just say that uh, we, we had this idea and, and uh, we found this incredible space. It was an abandoned place. It sits on an absolutely stunningly gorgeous green public space in Jerusalem with sweeping views of the city, but that has been all but abandoned for almost 20 years since the Second Intifada because it sits exactly between not just Israeli and Palestinian neighborhoods, but also rich and poor neighborhoods, all of the complexity in this one gorgeous green public space. Um, and we, we uh, got this place, we, we found it abandoned, we renovated it to be able to use it, and we got the keys on March 1st, 2020, which was impeccable timing. Um, wow. And what, what we wound up doing um, is that we had, over the years, built this incredibly diverse team. I think we're probably the most diverse arts organization in Israel, Israel-Palestine. And, um, and we decided we could not, you know, everybody was slashing budgets, and we had to also. We decided we could not slash our team. We had to keep the team, because the team was everything. We slashed everything else, and we couldn't use our indoor space. And so we went out into this incredible green space. And we went out in the beginning, we went from being a very sophisticated you know, arts organization with very complicated productions to just taking our team that has artists and, and folks who are not artists, sitting in this green space, slowly inviting people to join us, and, and really just sort of bring coffee and tea into the space so that the people that were already in the space would know that we weren't there to push them out. Pouring coffee, pouring tea, cookies, and at a moment where you could really only meet with like 20 people in a, in a spot in, 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 in the outdoors. Um, and, uh, and little by little, that boundary between the professional arts and the community that was coming, yeah. that kind of dissolved entirely. And today we think of ourselves almost, I would say, as much a, a, as, as a community center as, than we do as, as an art center. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's maybe what I'll say for now. Mm. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. So all of these kind of you know, arts civic overlaps require uh, certain qualities. And I was thinking about that, Kate. You, know, you have birthed a thousand of these. You've you know, been brought a thousand of these, like this you know, ambitious kind of, look, we want to do this in a city. You are part of that consulting team that Mayor Bloomberg put together that goes globally to cities to advise them on how to uh, put uh, their cities into a, a next step, a next level, including through arts and culture. And I was wondering, could we talk a little bit about the qualities um, of the partnerships? Like, what, what are the qualities of on, on the culture side, on the city side, or the the institution side that, that you've seen? I think the key quality is that you have to respect creativity. You know, artists are not gonna stay in a box and that's what's valuable about them. And you know, running a city agency that was dedicated to creativity in the context of every other city service, it became really clear to me that citizens with good reason look to government for standardized services. I want my garbage picked up with the same frequency as you. I want the same response time on ambulances or fire trucks. And the thing about the arts is that they appear to be unstandardized. And you know, that's their extraordinary value. But if you can convince 
and help create partnerships that are modeled around this notion that the, the, the creativity is always going to look different, but the underlying impact of it you can count on. You know, the, Chris's work looks different from the other 64 works that we've funded, but the process by which this corner was picked by the city of Aspen, dangerous corner, uh, you know, the, the process by which people were invited to join, the process by which there was a conversation in which some people were like, this is a really stupid idea, and some people were then completely won over by the end of the day. Uh, you know, it, it is that act of social cohesion that whether you're, you know, a, a Lincoln Center or you're a community effort being started in someone's bathroom, you know, that's, that's the key piece of it. What doesn't work in partnerships is when civil society, government tries and to tell artists what to do um, and or doesn't create guardrails in which the actual ideas can really flourish. Um, you know, other than that, I think the, the, the key piece is to understand the arc of amateur to professional um, is not your enemy. Uh, that's in fact what you're kind of going for for the most successful uh, kind of partnerships. And I was, I was saying earlier today, there was a really interesting study done a couple of years ago in the US that tested the phrase arts and culture versus uh, creative expression. Arts and culture ranked very low because people respect virtuosity but they don't feel like they're musicians. Right, mm -hmm. even though they love music and they play it a lot. Whereas with creative expression, everybody has a favorite poem, everybody has you know a favorite book, everybody has a creative thing, mm -hmm. and so creating partnerships that really embrace this, whether it's you know just creating more welcome for an audience, mm -hmm. you know I'm all about the good bathrooms, um, you know really uh, yes. relentless on accessibility issues. Um, so you got it, you got to welcome people into the space, but but really helping figure out how to generate a conversation that doesn't get trapped around the issue of quality, I think has been you know, really top line, the key to partnerships that work. I think there's probably some, some methodology behind that, uh, erasing that barrier that it doesn't become, oh, those artists, or oh my god, those city people. You know, they're, they're, the impossibility of that relationship where people can inhabit both worlds. Uh, you told me some things, uh, Mayor Carter, about uh, making people even sing a little bit Make before people. sing oh, before yeah. they before yeah. you actually get to the, yeah. the business at hand. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I wanted to, to to go there with the tactics a little bit. Yeah. Another thing you said is that a uh, great organization that I'm familiar with in St. Paul Springboard for the Arts, wonderful leader Laura Zabel. You said, oh yeah, she's my go-to. Yes. You know, what does that mean? What yes. does that look like? Yes. I thought you said making people sin. I was going to say, no, I didn't sin, think I said no, that. No, no sin, sing. The microphone was off when I said that. Um, no, no, yeah, we used to do an annual candidate uh, karaoke event. It was like a, like a candidate forum for people who were running for office. And our, our literally only rule, the whole, I think we did it six years in a row, and our only rule ever was, if you want to speak, you absolutely have to sing first. <laughs> Um, and it was, and one of the, as you talk about the difference between like the professionalism, one of the things that kind of, because we have some folks who actually can sing, right, can sing pretty good, um, and nobody cared, right? Like people really felt honored by people who came into the space. Every year we'd give away two trophies. One was most entertainment, most entertaining, and the other one was most creative, or most courageous, that's what it was. <laughs> and it had to be with like air quotes, like that was courageous. <laughs> And the people who like were the courageous ones uh, were the ones who like really like people adore and people loved, and it like just yeah. broke down these these barriers uh, in, in a way that was just really incredible. So that's one of the things that we try to do is think about ways to just sort of use the arts to tell the story of our city, tell the, to tell the story of what we're doing. Uh, we shared, as a matter of fact, you mentioned our guaranteed income work uh, just what two weeks ago at Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, we premiered uh, a film, a documentary film about our guaranteed income work in St. Paul and around the country. I'm one of the national co-chairs of an organization called Mayors for Guaranteed Income, and we premiered a, a, a documentary film called It's Basic. Um, and I've shared with folks that uh, we are on our fourth right now uh, guaranteed income pilot. One of them was in partnership with Springboard for the Arts. And that was a guaranteed income for artists yes. uh, initiative uh, that was pretty incredible. That took two neighborhoods in our community and said, we want, we, we want to be invested as a city. We want to be invested as a community in telling the stories 
of our community and making sure that we kind of move those forward. I have a story, I have a, a long time ago kind of a, a background in uh, storytelling from the West African perspective of uh, the word is the, of the griot. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to say like, how do we uh, use every medium we can to tell the stories uh, and while well, frankly making sure that art, artists could survive the pandemic. And you say you had a, you got the keys on uh, March 1st? March 1st. I got a daughter on March 3rd, 2020. Oh my so God. Um, I, I know what it feels like. Wow. Um, but making sure that families in those moments that were more vulnerable than ever could make it through those months and have the ability to show some art for it. So we got some really incredible art. Uh, that not just uh, is creative expression, but is creative expression in song uh, and in mosaic art and in all kinds of different formats uh, of, uh, to tell the story yeah. of guaranteed income and how that impacted families. So it's pretty, it's very meta. Very. I love this conversation so, for so many reasons, but among them is that idea of participation being the, the essential risk activity. It's like, are you going to sing? Because if you don't sing, you're not going to get the reward of actually getting to speak. Yes. Uh, you are not going to have that sense of joy. And thinking about some of the sessions over the last days here at Ideas, there was this uh, Price, Catherine Price, talking about the, the, the influence of delight. You know, you see something that it delights you, say it, you know, and experience it. We've all been there. You stand on the side of the dance floor. Are you going to actually participate? And you know that it's going to be better. It's going to, it's going to take you there. You know it's better. And yet, there's a risk to it. There's potential embarrassment. There's something else involved in your life. And you think, I just can't be bothered. But it actually is, uh, it is something that takes you somewhere else. And uh, hearkening back to a moment I had here at Aspen a couple of years ago, I taught uh, a little dance. We talked about that yesterday. The beginning of a Balanchine Ballet serenade. And the uh, whole audience did it. And it was Aspen's Ideas Festival, so it was not just any audience. And uh, Stephen Breyer was there, Justice Breyer. And in this time of Supreme Court decisions, he came over to my wife, Heather, and I after, and he said, I've been struggling with what, what this was. And he said, you know what? I realized for the first time in my life, I was the art. Mm. I was the art. And I, I thought about that listening to you. It's like there's something profound about that, taking a risk to do it. Um, but I, that leads me back to, to you, Karen, and you know, where risk has a whole other meaning in terms of the stakes in Jerusalem mm -hmm. uh, for lots of different reasons. And, uh, we all know a promotional film brings brings all the good. Yep. Uh, how do you how do you navigate that? How have you navigated that? Earlier, you talked about a thousand mistakes. You know, just to get to that place where of trust and bringing people to that moment where it doesn't feel like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, well, Kate, you mentioned 9/11, um, and I think oftentimes, uh, you know, those there are crises that are. Um, these moments that are incredibly difficult, and then you can also find, you, you grow out of them. Um, we had, uh, in 2014, there was, uh, in the summer of 2014, there was a, a very um, horrible war uh, between Israel and, 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 and Gaza. Um, and it actually started right around Jerusalem. Um, it was triggered by something that happened in Jerusalem. Right outside of Jerusalem, there were um, three Jewish teenagers who were uh, kidnapped uh, by um, by Palestinians, no one knew where they were for three weeks, and the whole sort of co the country was sort of waiting with bated breath to figure out where these three boys were. Um, when their bodies were discovered, dead, um, I, I live in downtown Jerusalem, and, and, and sort of all hell broke loose on the streets of Jerusalem, um, and Jewish extremists sort of poured out into downtown Jerusalem looking for revenge, uh, looking for, for uh, pa Palestinians to beat up. Um, and um, that night, three Jews kidnapped a Palestinian teenager um, and, and killed him in the Jerusalem forest. Um, <laughs> and we, it, was, um, it, it was a crazy moment uh, because we were actually two days before the opening of our festival uh, when all of this happened. And we had created this crazy idea, which was we took um, two uh, chefs, one who is this very, very uh, big emerging uh, Israeli chef from West Jerusalem, and one who was his counterpart, the same on the Palestinian side. And we asked them to envision the new Jerusalem kitchen, okay? Mm -hmm. And they spent a year researching what we eat in Jerusalem and why, 
uh, the agriculture, the Ottoman influence, the, the, the different cultures, and they were going to put this out for audiences exactly in a spot on Mount Zion, exactly between their two houses. And this was a flagship project, and we had worked very, very hard to ensure that there would be a mixed, a, 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 a diverse audience, Israeli and Palestinian. And we hit a bump around something kind of that happens in Jerusalem around the issue of kashrut, which is uh, kosher, Jewish, uh, what, what religious Jews can eat. Because these two chefs, we told them to be artists. They imagined the most crazy uh, thing that they could have ever imagined. Neither of them cooks kosher, right? But we had said to them, listen, you got to be kosher because this city has a, a hell of a lot of people that need kosher. And they said, sure, sure, sure. They got, we were already out in the press, and they, and they came to say, listen, really sorry, just can't do it. Um, sorry. Yeah. And we were, I was like, Ugh. Uh, and and um, there was actually a, a sort of a division in our team between artistic freedom, this value, versus inclusion of a, of a huge percentage of, of the population. And I and our artistic director were on opposite ends of this, this argument. And you can imagine where he was, because <laughs> he's the artistic director. Um, and immediately after um, the murder of Muhammad Abu Khdir, the, the Palestinian uh, teenager, um, there was a, a demonstration of Jews saying not in our name in downtown Jerusalem. And the artistic director and I, we went to this demonstration and it was, there were hundreds of people there and it was very emotional. This was, it was, it was this, this, this teenager was burned alive. And it was an, inc it was a very, uh, I don't even know how to describe that moment. But we went to this demonstration and when we walked out, our artistic director turned to me and he said, it has to be kosher. And I said, why? I knew why, but I, he lives in Tel Aviv, which is a phenomenal city, a much more homogeneous city than Jerusalem. And when he goes to demonstration, he goes to this, this place called Z Rabin Square, named after the, our murdered prime minister, which is, and Tel Aviv is the capital of secular Israel. And the, the, the demonstrations are on Saturday nights, which if you're a secular Jew, you might not realize that Saturday nights is not exactly a good time for a religious Jew. You might not notice that. So when he goes to demonstrations, he doesn't see any kippot. And so he thought that they didn't care, right? And, and also that falls out with like left and right in Israel, religious tend to be more right, secular more left. And in Jerusalem, a city that is always teaching you lessons, full of religious people, it was, the, the place was full of religious Jews. They were the speakers, they were the ones that led it from a Jewish place. And this incredibly wonderful person, artistic director, who was a very enlightened person, suddenly, suddenly this blind spot Mm. illuminated, was illuminated for him. And we realized we had a blind spot in our organization. We started going around Jerusalem and realizing that there's these religious people who we sort of, you know, some of their friends or their are friends or their, their audience. And we realized we don't understand something. And we went to a place called the Hartman Institute and we sat with religious Jews who are completely our kindred spirits. And he cried all day long. And our CEO, Nomi Fortis, who was the CEO of Batsheva, cried all day long. Mm. And that moment, we realized we had to bring this experience to our audiences. And it's the, the stories of the people. We realized that that smack in the face that Jerusalem gives you, we have to turn into art. And we did. Um, I, I'll, I can talk more of that on, in another session. But, but um, we have gone since then through several wars. I think there's been six family members, four killed almost equally on each side in the time that we've been working together from people on our team. It's, it's, for us, it's existential. This is not nice to have. This is our way to stay in this place that we love and envision a better future for it. So, we, we spoke of building an audience. And when we think about it in the context of what you just shared, and we think about it in terms of the, the recovery of a city like New York, we think about you know, your incredible, the joy that you bring to the way you describe what you're doing in St. Paul. In the course of hard work, that joy is there, that you're, you walk down the sidewalk and you are providing something that is actually creating in that moment a story about where you are. And I think that storytelling is, is key in that. Just, just the word. Just say the word, storytelling. It's what, that's arts and culture. From time immemorial right to this moment, to the story of like, you know, 
We walked by on, on the weekend and they were painting out there white. They painted it white. We didn't know why they were painting it white. We had no idea what was going on. But we thought, this is interesting, what's happening here? And then we learned. And that's a story. That's a story that'll live and it'll have an impact and it'll have a covert impact. Safety will be better. There will be other things, but there will be delight in all of this. So we're gonna turn to some audience questions in that moment of participation and storytelling uh, before we close with some final words from each of our panelists. So we have a microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, question would be good, uh, not a, but uh, please, we'll start here. Hi, my name is Morgan. Um, I, I work in St. Paul, Minnesota, so I just first wanted to thank huh. Eric Carter for, for everything the this, this city has done. The city supports our theater, Theater Moo, yes. in our work, um, as well as the state, and continues to support us. And thank you all for everything you've shared. Um, I'm shaking already because I'm. <laughs> my question is about uh, what happened in 2020. Um, so in, in 2020, when uh, George Floyd was murdered by the Minneapolis police, um, in the uprisings that followed, the, the square was reclaimed by the community and it was filled with art. It was, it was filled with voices, music, art on the sidewalks, flowers, structures. Um, and throughout the city and in that square, that art was our glue during a really difficult time. It held us together and uh, it helped us find peace and healing and grief and action. And um, the community held that square for two years, just about two years, uh, but in a sort of a tense relationship with the city of Minneapolis. It was not sanctioned. Um, and eventually there was an agreement reached somehow where some of the art remained. It remained as a memorial. The city reopened the street. It continues to be a very sacred space for me as a resident of that neighborhood. Um, but the question I have for you, and I don't mean to make Mayor Carter speak for a city that's not his, um, but for all of you, how, how does the city approach art that, that comes from the community, that rises from us and reflects the community but is not sanctioned, and how can we work with officials to help preserve that? Um, the murder of George Floyd was something that we experienced very closely. Uh, and far more intimately than anybody ever wanted to. Uh, and it was a, um, I don't know, I think I, I, I probably still have some reflecting to do on all of those moments because it was, th those were definitely the hardest moments I've ever had in my career. In some of those moments where I guess we all, you, you have to say something, but there's nothing that can be said. Um, it's a really heavy question, particularly uh, with the preamble that you gave it, uh, which is, I mean, which is important. Um, I, of course, spent a not insignificant amount of time in those spaces, um, and being born and raised in the Twin Cities, being born and raised in St. Paul, uh, many of those folks who were at the forefront of the activism are, end up being people I grew up with, uh, people I've known all my life, people. Uh, you know, who we, we know each other very, very well. Um, and in truth, and as the person who is charged with uh, being the administrator of city laws, and thank you, I, I of course cannot speak for Minneapolis um, or any other city. I tell folks all the time, I'm like, I look forward to the day when I have time to just ponder the, the activities of other cities. Um, but it's this really strange, kind of space. I was having this kind of a non sequitur. My daughters and I were walking through a park one day and there was a sign that said no skateboarding right above where the kids were all skateboarding. <laughs> and my daughter kind of said, oh, those are bad kids when she was younger. And I was like, are they? Why? And she was like, because the rule says no skateboarding, <laughs> right? And I was like, well, you know, and we end up having this like intriguing conversation about rules and what they mean. Um, and not that I'm saying don't skateboard in places. <laughs> no, definitely. When I, when, I, when, I, when I first was on the city council years ago, we had an incident at one of our parks where we had some gang graffiti uh, spray painted at the park. And sooner or later, somebody came, up, came around and crossed that graffiti out and did some other gang graffiti and somebody else came across and scrapped, scratched that out and did the other. And eventually someone got shot. And um, I was pretty livid, as it turns out, you know, 
Uh, our police department knew it was there and was investigating, and et cetera. But our parks and rec department, who are the ones who come and paint over it, never got the memo, you know, and it just became this space. Um, and we ended up in this conversation about kind of like, like how do we do better where this is concerned? Um, and it was intriguing because we ended up sucking in kind of like artistic graffiti and gang graffiti into the same category. And I ended up saying, hey, can we just say there's two kinds of graffiti. There's the kind that might get somebody shot, and there's the kind that's not going to get somebody shot. <laughs> and when the cops say this kind might get somebody shot, let's just paint over it, and like, we'll figure out what all the rules are after the fact. But it was really in it intriguing to me that that recently, we didn't really have a functional definition, a functional distinction um, to, to, to honor the type of like grassroots community that just comes from community and sprouts up type of art. Uh, that is the lifeblood of so many communities. That is that is uh, so important to community, and we didn't we didn't necessarily. Well, I'll say this: our distinction between uh, constructive art and destructive art was sort of whether you have a city permit or not, right? Um, which uh, seems to be somewhat of an arbitrary. And you know, I, I have to be careful because I'm on camera and do get city permits. Um, <laughs> that's very important. Um, but we want to be a space where people can create. And we talk all the time about co-governance and co-creation. And I told you, I was raised by jazz. And the incredible thing about jazz is seven people can be on a stage creating something uh, purely unique, purely like in the moment. And they're all creating at the same time. And it's better for it, right? Yeah. So as we talk about, like, as we talk about um, co-governance, as we talk about co-creation, as we talk about trust, the conversation that we had, um, there, there may be no uh, uh, venue, uh, there may, may be no, no, no vehicle in the human experience that has been more successful at facilitating those types of interactions than the arts. So figuring out that question, I think, is really important for us. Thank you. Uh, one more over here. Oh, I'd like to echo Mayor Carter, if there's any place where we could see a, a photo of that artwork that you love, that you cre um, helped create oh, behind your office. desk. And then also, Karen, I'd love to ask the way we could see the square between the two conflicting worlds, or see the process before and after, or something like that. Is there any place we can visually see that? Oh, what? where you created your center. Oh, oh, the before and after. Yes, maybe she'll give you the website after. Be great. Yeah, I, yeah, I, we'll, I, can, we'll I, can, I can find it for you. Probably. Uh, we don't have, I don't figure that out. We should have it. Yeah, we should have it. We should have it. It was supposed to be, you know, short, but <laughs> we should have it. You're right. We're at time, but I want to I wanna thank everybody, but I want to finish with a, a closing thought maybe from everybody. Around the making of space, which I think was intrinsic to your question and uh, the mayor's response, that idea of the choice of whether you make space or not, which, you know, is not entirely... Uh, clear sometimes and sometimes might even feel arbitrary. It's a judgment call. But it is, you know, to, to think about what you said, Kate, uh, you know, siding on the side of the creative to a degree to say this, we know that this can, can benefit, this has benefit, and we will find a way. Uh, I, can, I also wanted to do a quick uh, tip of the hat. I was going to be with you enjoying this conversation, but I'm replacing Shanta Thak, who is the artistic director for Lincoln Center in corporate, which is the, the, the space, if you've been to New York and been to Lincoln Center, that houses Juilliard, Metropolitan Opera, New York City Ballet, Film Society, 11 constituents. Uh, and it is itself uh, a place, a space for, for constituents to make art, but it's also a place to gather. And one of the things that she's done uh, there in the last two years uh, has been creating those spaces. They did a wedding, a mock wedding, for 500 couples coming out of the pandemic to come with music and art and non-denominational to gather people who had gotten married during the pandemic in unusual circumstances. They have a giant disco ball, the biggest one in the world, to draw people to. You know, you come out of the opera and there's a disco ball there. It goes silent around 10. Uh, and it's just that, that willingness to make a space for things to happen is key. So maybe we could, we could think about this, because everybody comes from somewhere. I know many are local here, but many are also coming from other places. Some, some thoughts around the, the building and making a space. I would just say the key is the process. You know, if the city of Aspen had just painted the street white and, you know, done whatever they'd done and hadn't created any kind of consultation, hadn't let people come participate, mm -hmm. that would feel differently. That they just did it. Yeah. 
You know, and part of what Shant is amazing at is creating a conversation. And at Lincoln Center, you know, she's mm -hmm. been unusually successful at getting constituents buy-in. You know, yeah. back in my day, I'd get called that someone was parking in someone else's slide. Like, do you want to come tow their car? Like, get along, um, figure it out. <laughs> but, but so, you know, I would say it, it, it's, it's honoring a creative idea, making it safe, because mm -hmm. public safety is kind of the key, right? Um, in, in how you take up space and how you allow the organic expression of citizens to shape a city, which it absolutely has to, otherwise, you know, it becomes a dead place, um, with a process that is, you know, sufficiently consultative. Um, you, you can't go on forever, uh, but you really do need to figure that out. And I think art and culture is uniquely suited to that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there, there are lots of ways of creating that conversation, but that's the process muscle that someone like, you know, Karen's an Olympic athlete at. And that's, that's the kind of practice that, again, in the past has been sometimes condescended to mm -hmm. by elite art. Um, you know, it should be the lone genius that gets to do it. And I think if, if we can right. all sort of tilt more towards that, uh, that, that notion of the arc of <laughs> amateur to professional with more respect, I think it will be easier to appreciate and value uh, how extraordinarily powerful art and culture is as a form of civic loop. Right, totally. Let me interject there, one little comparable for you. Many of you uh, who have been coming to Aspen Ideas for years may remember the incredible Memphis Jook and dancer Lil Buck, who's like an international phenomenal dancer. Little Buck comes out of a street dance tradition out of Memphis, just like you have, uh, you know, footwork in, you know, Chicago, and you got the JIT in Detroit, and uh, go on. Every city has it. And Little Buck was in New York, and he was filming uh, a little incredible film. If you Google Little Buck Lincoln Center, you can see it. And they were on the new renovated Lincoln Center, uh, and they were no permit. <laughs> And it goes on for about three minutes, and it finishes when the guards come over and say, hey, man, I'm sorry, you can't dance here. Uh, and it was just it was this fantastic thing, actually. And it, it pointed out kind of the, the, you know, the divine comedy of it all. But it also was instructive. And it, he wouldn't get stopped today. He wouldn't, actually. Mayor, you want to you opine on making space? I mean, you've said a lot already. But, or anything else you want to add to this conversation? Uh, I just challenge us to listen. We talked earlier about listening, and you talked about building an audience, right? Um, and then I, I think that invokes uh, our, our willingness to be an audience. We know when we come into this space that there's a stage, and there's a microphone, and there's chairs, and there's lights that remind me of high school uh, theater. Um, I have uh, maybe monologues later, uh, not at all. We'll um, but if everybody's an artist, mm -hmm. that means we're literally surrounded by art all day, every day. And it's somewhat arbitrary to think that there has to be a, a, a stage in order for art to be happening. And it's, it's, it's intriguing to me to think that we can identify the people who we think we have no common ground with, or people we think you know, we, don't, we disagree with on everything, and challenge ourselves to see the art in them, and not only see the art in them, but be a willing audience for them. That doesn't mean you have to agree with everything that they say, but to the extent that we uh, challenge ourselves to be to to see the art in someone, and be willing to uh, listen and um, let it let it let it impact us, let us let it touch us. Um, I think we can uh, change a whole lot of things about the world. Here, here. Last word, Karen. Um, well, I think there's also something ab uh, about making creating a home, making people feel at home. Um, our name is ac actually means feel at home. And it's a polyglot of English and Arabic, feel bit. Um, and I guess what that means is, is that when people walk into our space, we work very hard so that they feel comfortable, that they're greeted in their, in their own language, that their cultural sensibilities are taken into consideration, that they see other people like them, they see themselves reflected, um, and that they know that they are in a city where people are scared of each other, that here they are safe, that they are welcome, that they're very much wanted. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll just say that for what we learned over time, and this is the difference between us at the t 12 years ago and now, is that you can't do that without being it, right? Sometimes Israeli, like secular Israeli friends will come to me and they'll say, how are all of these Palestinians here? How, because that's not something normal that happens, that Israelis and Pal hundreds of Israelis and Palestinians are getting together in the same, how did that happen? How did you do that? I said, I didn't do it. Riman, 
and our, our Palestinian team did it. How did all these ultra, like, how are you getting ultra orthodox to, to come into your space? I said, first of all, I'm not there when they're there because that's they need that space, and they do it. We don't do it, and that's I think. Radical welcome. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.